If you watch my other videos, you know I said that someday the Seventh-day Adventist church was going to have a homosexual church, maybe even a homosexual pastor. Now, I thought it might happen in California, and and there are churches out there, we know that, but they're not official churches, not sanctioned churches. They're kinship. Um, they operate outside the official channels. But now, now we have a not just a church. No, not just a church. We have a whole conference, the Netherlands Union Conference, that has made a stance to welcome in every homosexual and make him full members. <clears throat> this position they've taken is brazen and shocking. Let me quote them word for word. Although we acknowledge the biblical ideal of a monogamous heterosexual relationship, we continue to emphasize that is an ideal. The basis of Christianity is that all people fall short of God's ideal. This is why we require God's grace in Christ's sacrifice. First, their theology here is so garbled up, but I'll get to that later. Anyway, they continue. This leads to the conclusion that we as Christians must welcome all children of God who all fall, fall short of God's idea. You like how they make all these straw men arguments and everything else? They can knock them down. Like, like making a mistake is the same as living in this open sin. Anyway, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let's continue what they said. So they want to welcome everybody in, into the churches with love. We advise the churches in the Netherlands to fully commit themselves to ensuring that LGBTI individuals feel safe in the church, whatever that means. We would strongly advise against any steps to revoke the membership of LGBTI people, given the unsafe environment this would create in the churches. Well, I'm not sure why it would make it unsafe. I don't even want to discuss that issue, but, but this is just so incredible in so many ways i don't even know where to start i think we should back up first and talk about why this all came to be <clears throat> for those of you who don't know there was an adventist conference in cape town <coughs> excuse me cape town africa this year on the issue of homosexuality and at this conference or summit or whatever you want to call it there were delegates from Every world division. They had three people talk about how they came out of homosexuality. And then they had sociologists and psychologists and different people talk about how it could be genetic. So apparently there were people on both sides of this issue. I wasn't there, so I can't tell you what the overall feel of the meeting was or the direction it was going in. To just have a statement of two doesn't tell us exactly what it was like to be there. But we do have the concluding statement that came from this conference. And that statement is this. It is inconsistent with the church's understanding of scriptural teaching to admit into or maintain a membership persons practicing sexual behaviors incompatible with biblical teachings. Neither is it acceptable for Adventist pastors or churches to provide wedding services or facilities for same-sex couples. <clears throat> okay, now this is where you need to put your thinking cap on and really do some critical thinking here. <clears throat> now you might be wondering why I'd say that. You might think this statement sounds great. Most conservatives will read this and say, it is great. But well, I tell you, most liberals will be reading this and deciphering it and know what's going on. Now let's take a closer look at this statement and also consider what Ted Wilson said at the close of the meetings. Put it all together and you tell me if you still think it sounds good. First, notice here they said, It is inconsistent with the church's understanding of Scripture. What? What do you mean our understanding of it? It's either clearly biblical or it's not, right? It's not just our understanding of it. The Catholics have an understanding of Scripture. 
The Baptists have an understanding. of Babylon has an understanding. Do we just have an understanding? I mean, it's either biblical or it's not. Don't take this wording lightly, people. <clears throat> you know, I know a group of men sat in back for hours and came up with this statement. Ted didn't just stand up and ra ramble something off. There's no way. They're very careful with what they say on such occasions. And then you have to ask yourself, why in the world would they say it like that? You people have to wake up and see what's going on right under your noses. If they wanted to stand on true biblical principles, then he would have said, homosexuality is a sin condemned in the Bible, and as such, practicing homosexuals cannot be members in the STA church because we are founded on biblical principles. Period. End of story. But instead we get, it is inconsistent with the church's understanding. What a joke. What a joke. And it's understanding of uh, uh, sexual behavior is un incompatible with biblical teachings. Well, who can, who's going to define what that is? See, people can define that differently. Just because they have that next statement about same-sex couples, I think the only reason they added that there is for the conservative churches. So when this gets passed throughout the world, not just the United States, that they can at least, uh, for a, a conservative pastor who doesn't want to marry them, they can say, well, my church said this, and maybe that gives them an out. Like, this is all political, people. That's all this is. I told you, I told you Ted Wilson is just a politic man. Don't be taken in by a few statements here or there. <clears throat> anyway, it gets worse, though, because Ted Wilson said this. This is what he said at the end of the meetings. That the conclusions from the meetings were only guidelines and not policies. <laughs> what? I mean, come on. We have a whole manual that's full of policies down to the most trivial things. And yet, they only have a guideline on this issue? What a farce! Is this not this a biblical issue? So why did they conclude with only a guideline? Meaning that statement, which was a, is only a guideline, not policy. I tell you why, because it gives plenty of wiggle room for the more liberal churches who want to baptize homosexual members. Whoa. <clears throat> so now we have that. We have a whole conference, the Netherlands Conference, taking a stand that's clearly unbiblical. And since it is only a guideline, they are perfectly able to do that and be within the guidelines of the Adventist church. So they decide all such people should be baptized members. And, you know, it just comes down to what I've said over and over and over again. What the main problem is in the church. What the underlying issue is that causes all other issues. This false understanding of what true justification is. This false live-in sin theology. Look at what the Netherlands Netherland Conference said again. They said, Although we acknowledge the biblical idea of a monogamous heterosexual relationship, so are they admitting at least that homosexuality is a sin? I bet they'll, I bet they'll backpedal on this statement. Because eventually they'll, have to say, they'll probably try to say it's not even a sin. But here they're saying, Yes, the Bible says, you know, a monogamous heterosexual relationship is ideal. They say the basis of Christianity is all people fall short of this ideal. Therefore, we got to let every sinner in. I said this 15 years ago. I said if you're going to excuse one sin and claim that, you know, we all have our sin and we all, we're all, it's like a big hospital and we're all sick in there and we all have our own individual sins, so, you know, we're covered with sin. I said, if you're going to excuse one, you have to excuse them all, including homosexuality. I said that probably two decades ago, and everybody thought I was crazy because they could never see that coming in church, but I said, eventually, they will have to 
allow that as well because if one sin is excused, they all are. And guess what? The very last sin is they will have to allow because if all sin is excused, I mean, if one sin is excused, they all have to be, and the very last one they will allow will be murder. That's right, people. We are going to repeat the history of Jews. Ellen White said that she was shown again and again that that's what we would do, and we're going to do it. And the last thing will be murder. They will murder the true followers. Yes, you're hearing me right. The Seventh-day Adventist structure will hunt down and murder the true followers. It will end like that just like it did with Israel. And they will continue claiming to be God's people covered by his grace as they do this. What twisted theology? Falling short is not the same as willfully living in open sin. Grace does not cover open, willful, habitual sins. But they don't make this distinction. What they're saying here is that living in known, open, willful sin is covered by Christ's sacrifice. To them, it's just human nature. It's how we are. They have no concept as to what a true born-again life is like. This is new theology in its purest form. This, this is what has happened to the church. And did you notice they called them children of God? How is someone who's practicing open sin a child of God? I don't know how you could even reason with someone that has such a garbled up theology. What has happened to the church that was to be the repairer of the breach, the builder of the wall, the restorer of the Ten Commandments? Today, the church says you can't keep the commandments. They say, so Christ's sacrifice covers us in our open sin. I hope you people see very clearly the different theology that has taken over the church today. What light we have from heaven and yet to fall on such foolish theology. There really is no excuse. Let me just read several quotes and verses back to back here. In case you're still a little confused on this true biblical Adventism and the new theology that is rampant in the church today. Faith and Works, page 115. While God can be just and yet justify the sinner through the merits of Christ, no man can cover his soul with the garments of Christ's righteousness while practicing known sins or neglecting known duties. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind shall inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, 19 manuscript release of uh, MR, page 177. That's manuscript releases, book 19. <clears throat> All who claim to be Sabbath-keeping Adventists and yet continue in sin are liars in God's sight. Their sinful course is counterworking the work of God. They are leading others into sin. Romans 6.2 How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Signs of the times. Jesus Christ will never save anyone who has a knowledge of the law, yet lives in transgression of it. 1 John and hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Message young people. There is no such thing as following Christ unless you refuse to gratify inclination and determine to obey God. It is not your feelings, your emotions, or your weird theology to make you a child of God, but the doing of God's will. Romans 8. For if ye after the flesh, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Notice how uh, oh, it seems to be saying the same thing the Bible is saying. Faith and works. In order for man to be justified by faith, faith must reach a point where it will control the affections and impulses of the heart. And it is by obedience that faith is made perfect. James, does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? 
For selected messages, it is by continual surrender of the will, by continual obedience, that the blessing of justification is retained. 1 John Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. So much light. <laughs> well, I told you this was coming. And I'll tell you this. The church is revealing this to prepare you for more of the same. You better be getting ready. People, things, things seem to be escalating. But why do I say they are revealing this to prepare you for more of the same? Because they always seem to have these summits before they eventually allow things to come into the church. Why does a conference even feel the need to do draw, long, drawn-out studies on issues we already have the answer to for? Do we already have the answer to? Take, for example, the wedding ban issue a couple decades ago. Why did they need a committee to study something we had clear counsel on? I mean, it took me all of 10 seconds to pull up this quote. Some have had a burden in regard to the wearing of a marriage ring, feeling that the wives of our ministers should conform to this custom. All this is unnecessary. Let the minister's wives have the golden link which binds their souls to Jesus Christ, a pure and holy character, the true love and meekness of godliness that are the fruit born upon the Christian tree, and their influence will be secure anywhere. The fact that a disregard of the custom occasions remark is no good reason for adopting it. And then she goes on, skipping in, and she says, we, not, we need not wear the sign, for we are not untrue to our marriage vow, and the wearing of the ring would be no evidence that we were true. I feel deeply over this leavening process, which seems to be going on among us. Not one penny should be spent for a circle of gold to testify that we are married. Well, that seems pretty plain to me. And yet they ruled opposite of that. And what happened? All kinds of jewelry came into the church with it. I know because I lived through it and I saw it. But why did they even have a study? What were they studying? Why not just do what the Lord told us? My opinion is they weren't studying anything at all. They had already decided to bring in wedding bands, but they just made a show of it. They put on an act in order to condition the minds of the people before they actually passed it. And I believe they're doing the same thing today with women's ordination. Have you heard anyone at the conference level stand up and say ordaining women is wrong? Anybody. I mean, maybe I missed it. I don't sit down and just listen to these guys constantly. If you know of someone, let me know, because I haven't heard that. I mean, there's a self-supporting guy here. There's a pastor here. But I haven't heard anyone at the conference level stand up and in print say that. Or, you know, write it in print or stand up somewhere and say it. What I have heard is that they are doing a study and nobody should move ahead of what they eventually decide. Isn't that strange? I mean, it seems like the Adventist church should already have an answer for such an issue. It's not a hard one to figure out. I just believe they're putting on a show, buying their time until people get a little more used to the idea. Did you know they have female pastors that are being sent out across the Midwest? I mean, the Midwest is fundamentally more conservative than the coast, so I believe they're test cases. They want to see how the people respond. And you know how they've responded. Like dead sheep. Oh, there might be a few people that are upset, but they just sit there and take it because they think they're supposed to sit there and take it. That's lunacy, people. So my point is the conference knows what it's going to do before they actually do it. So if you watch what issues they are discussing, you will know what's coming soon into your church. And so what's the next thing coming into your church? Well, what was the summit in Africa about? Exactly.
make no mistake about it, people. Listen to this video again. Look at the statements and how they how they worded it and how Ted Wilson said it's just guidelines. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. Start thinking critically. They know what they're doing and they're preparing things for, for things to come. They're getting the people prepared for things to come. I think I should end with these two Ellen White quotes. You better take them seriously. This is from uh, a letter, 1892. She said, take the young men and women and place them where they, will, where they will come as little in contact with our churches as possible. That the low grade of piety, which is current in the day, shall not leaven their ideas of what it means to be a Christian. <laughs> the low grade in her day? What would she think today? 1905. From 1905, you have to make all the statements of hers fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. I hear so many people, or I get on YouTube, so so many comments of people saying, "Well, it's still God's church, and it's going through, no matter what." And more and more people are doing that now. I believe because of certain self-supporting. Ministers have got up and brainwashed them to think this. I tell you, you need to get every statement, and they have to make sense together. They can't contradict. Put them chronologically and see what's going on. Here it is, 1905. It says, I am instructed to say that we must do all we possibly can for these deceived ones. She's talking about an issue today, but the principle certainly would apply. Would apply. She was talking about an issue in her day but the principle would certainly apply today. Okay? You have deceived people. We do all we can to try and wake them up. Their minds must be freed from the delusions of the enemy. But if we fail in our efforts to save these erring ones, we must sit there and take it and read our Bible quietly with our bottom glued to the pew. She doesn't say that, does she? We must... Come out from among them and be separate. Quit trusting in men and start studying. Things are escalating. Things are winding up. You better get ready, get ready, get ready. <laughs>